The sermon this morning, hey, Jesus doing? Walks on Water. The sermon tonight, Searching for Jesus. <laughs> Ladies, don't forget the rummage sale. It's a chance to get rid of those things not worth keeping around the house. Bring your husbands. <laughs> Remember in prayer the many who are sick of our community. <laughs> Smile at someone who's hard to love. Say, hell, to someone who doesn't much care about you. <laughs> Miss Charlene Mason saying, I will not pass this way again, giving obvious pleasure to the congregation. <laughs> Irving Benson and Jesse Carter were married on October 24th in the church. So ends a friendship that began in their school days. <laughs> At the evening service tonight, the sermon topic will be, What is Hell? Come early and listen to our choir practice. <laughs> Please place your donation in the envelope along with the deceased person you want to remember. <laughs> the church will host an evening of fine dining, super entertainment, and gracious hostility. <laughs> Ladies Bible study will be held Thursday evening at 10 a.m. Thursday morning, sorry. Thursday morning at 10 a.m. All ladies are invited to lunch in the fellowship hall after the BS is done. <laughs> Bible study. The pastor would appreciate it if the ladies of the congregation would lend him their electric girdles for the pancake breakfast next Sunday. <laughs> the associate minister unveiled the church's new campaign slogan last Sunday. I upped my pledge. Up yours. <laughs> We're going to have a uh, meditation led by Jim Spivey, and he also has an announcement. Um, are there people here, if there, if there are people here who don't get the emails at SNET, would you raise your hand? I'd like to know how many people I'll be talking to. Um, I tried to put Jervis back on there, but it was already on there, so if you let me know. Anyone else? Okay. Most of you got the emails, and the second one I sent, the first one I sent out had a lot of garbled characters in it because I didn't know how to send the photo through Gmail. I figured out how to do that and resend it along with a new note. Um, reminding you about security. Last week, uh, during our meeting, there was a, a car that uh, was broken into, the window was smashed out, and a small purse was taken. It didn't have any va anything of value in it, but somebody thought it did. So it is, this is a reminder to not leave things so that they can be seen in your car. We, we, the, the, the young men do go around and watch for vandalism and break-ins and stuff, but obviously they didn't cover that. It was maybe a block and a half away. So that's just a reminder to be careful and to um, be cognizant that these kind of things go on. So uh, with that good news, please relax yourself for a few moments. We're going to change gears. Taking a deep breath. It's amazing. Let it all out, and as you let out your breath, feel the stress strains, toxins leaving your body. Carbon dioxide leaves your body and feeds the trees around us, giving us the oxygen that we breathe in. It's freshly generated, freshly made, going to every cell of your body. It's amazing. Feeding all the organs, feeling the brain. Just relax. Tune in to those things that are good, creative, constructive in your lives, that give meaning and purpose. 
so that he looked forward to waking up to every day. And as you continue to relax, let the feeling of the good come in and permeate your whole body, just as the oxygen goes to every cell of your body. Feeling it synchronizing, working with all the organs, and all the organs working in harmony. Feeling peace. Listening to the sounds of the birds. The dripping of the rain. Just allowing yourself to be. Bringing back this feeling of peace with you as you come into full awareness of all around you. Waiting for the messages from the creativity. Talk. Applying it in your life. This Sunday, our guest speaker is Rob Crackle. He's going to talk to us about ways for unlocking our creativity. Robert Krakow is a serial entrepreneur, inventor, artist, sculptor, and novelist, residing here since 2003. Over the years, Robert has sustained his quest for knowledge regarding creativity and the brain, and he spoke at Open Circle last year on how computer gaming is good for the brain. Rob? being here and talking about creativity in such a creative environment that we live in. I actually have two objectives for the next 45 minutes. And I need my glasses to do this. One is to enhance our understanding of the creative process to this already wonderfully creative members of our community. And the other is to, is to uh, help those who are, might be creatively challenged to improve their creative lives. <clears throat> a little bit about myself first. Uh, I, at, a, at 37 years old, I moved to from Southern California from my surfing life to uh, the uh, to the middle of the Midwest to speak at Kansas. Don't ask me why. Uh, I was asked. Uh, I was in I, I was in the marketing side, and I was actually asked to judge an uh, American Advertising Federation contest at the uh, University of uh, Lawrence, or uh, excuse me, at the University of Kansas in Lawrence, Kansas. And after a few weeks, I became friends with the dean of the business school. And eventually, he re realized I was pretty bored, and he asked me if I could start, if I could uh, teach a, a graduate class. And he asked me uh, if there was anything I could, uh, I could lend. And I said, well, I said, yes, I, I would choose to teach creativity. And I did so for the next three and a half years. Uh, my class were all graduate students, and they represented some of the finest minds on campus. They came to my class for insights and inspiration for unlocking the creative genie inside them so that as they moved into the real world. One of the first things I actually did with them is I said, uh, all right, I want to actually test your creativity and we'll, we'll do a little uh, experiment. Let's do some competition. There was a restaurant on campus called Sergeant Preston's, which had really good burgers, as I recall. And uh, so I, uh, I, I challenged them to a uh, paper plane flying contest. <laughs> And I said, uh, it's me against, there were about 20 students in the class, I said, it's me against you, and uh, whoever flies the most planes across the room in, 30, in 60 seconds uh, will buy the other dinner. So I, I was uh, basically banking my ability to fly paper planes against the 20 people in the class. Seemed a little unfair, but uh, they had, uh, they separated themselves into teams. They had passers, folders, and throwers. And in the 60 seconds, they managed to fly, I think, 17 uh, paper planes across the room. And then it came to be my turn, and the clock started, and I just stood there 
I gave about 30 seconds. I counted out 18 pieces of paper. I folded them into a big wad and threw them across the room. <laughs> Obviously, they didn't like this. They thought it was a little unfair. Um, and I said, yes, but who, who's, what are the rules that say how you fold a paper plane? And uh, they wound up buying me dinner. Um, so uh, kind of the question is, over, over your life, how many things have uh, blended your capacity for wonder and creativity? Perhaps we go all the way back to our earlier days in the school days when the teacher's curriculum taught us to search for the one right answer. The problem with searching for the one right answer is that life doesn't, really, real life doesn't present itself that way. Problems and solutions come in many shades of gray. As Sigmund Freud said, neurosis is the inability to tolerate ambiguity. Many of us uh, certainly lack a worldly experience as we succumb to an education of uh, decisions based on the right and, right and wrong without ambiguity. Only one correct response for every question or set of circumstances. Surely life taught us that often uh, <clears throat> through difficult circumstances there are many uh, answers and solutions to real life problems and there are many shades of gray when it comes to seeking the right answers. How many of my students were afraid to stand apart from the crowd and lead the way? I actually uh, asked two, set, two sets of students the same question, another test. I asked uh, a group of five-year-olds, I went to a blackboard and I drew a big white dot on the blackboard and co covered it in. So I asked the same question, what is this to you? The five-year-old said, it's the eye of the eagle, it's an ice cream cone, it's a fastball coming at you, it's millions of things. They had uh, a polar bear eating a snow cone. I mean, they just had so many ideas. And when I did the same thing with my graduate students, 20-something-year-olds, deadly silence. Nobody would venture out an answer. Finally, one brave person in the back of the room stood up and said, that's a big white circle on a blackboard. Uh, so the five-year-olds, you know, had not learned to seek the one right answer. The college graduates had spent 15 years of their lives actually having their, their creativity surgically removed. They were simply afraid to stand apart. The tendency is to push limits and perceive things in new ways, uh, make those less than creative, uh, comfortable. Excuse me. I think I'll so, creative people tend to approach the world in fresh and original ways that are not shaped by preconceptions of convention. The obvious order and rules that are so evident of less creative people, and which give the comfort structure to life are not perceived by the creative individual, who tends to see things in a different and novel way. This openness and new, experiment, uh, uh, new experience often permits creative people to observe things that others cannot, because they do not wear the blinders of con conventionality when they look around them. <clears throat> this openness is accompanied by tolerance for ambiguity. So the, uh, the creative people do not crave the absolutism of black and white worlds. They are quite comfortable with shades of gray. In fact, they enjoy life in a world that is filled with unanswered questions and blurry boundaries. Creative people enjoy adventure. They like to explore, and they, and they explore as they push the limits of social convention. They thrive in new surroundings and faraway places like Lake Chapala. They dislike externally imposed rules. They are seemingly driven by their own set of rules derived from within. Paradoxically, the creative person's indifference to convention is combined with sensitivity. Uh, creative people tend to have a high sense of, uh, of themselves and often others. Uh, creative people also have traits that make them durable and persistent. They're adventurous, adventurous and rebellious, this often coupled with playfulness. The capacity to approach the world in a playful, even childlike manner adds to, uh, to an inner joy, uh, joyous tone to life in the, of the creative person. Creative people also have the ability to persist in spite of uh, re repeated rebuffs. 
Persistence is absolutely fundamental. Since creative people typically experience rejection because of their tendency to push the limits and perceive things in new ways that make them less, less than creatively uncomfortable. Creative people must retain the capacity to keep going even in the face of, of little external validation of their worth. Creative people are intensely curious. And they like to understand how and why, take things apart, move domains of the mind and spirit and, convention, and conventional society perceives as forbidden or hidden. Their curiosity has also, driven, also has a driven and energetic quality. Once absorbed in an idea or topic, they pursue it with dogged intensity. Often their work is, is, really that, uh, is really all that creative people really care about. Okay, so I think I, you know, the, the best example I have of, of the creative mind is my own. So let's look at my behavior. Do you dare? <laughs> uh, as a serial entrepreneur and inventor of sorts, a painter, a sculptor, a writer, I've been labeled as somewhat creative by my creditors. Uh, currently writing my fourth novel, I may or not be a great, great writer, but I do convey the bearing of, of being somewhat creative. No matter what it is I'm working on, they tend to slip into a state that is apart from reality. I can, I can easily mentally disassociate myself from my surroundings and metaphorically go to another place. Really, since nobody wants to know that I've left my body and gone to Cleveland, I usually don't share this with everybody. <laughs> um, when I'm writing or painting, I do not do it consciously. A muse sits on my shoulder. Uh, the notion of a muse or need for inspiration is much more than just a metaphor. Even with uh, months of research and preparation, when I get, begin writing, I don't know wh where it comes from. It just simply happens. Of course, if the work is shit, I just blame it on the music. <laughs> uh, being creative is responsible for my social quirks. At least that's the excuse for much of my social ineptitude. For example, my mind wanders even when I talk. I'm actually thinking about other things right now. Um, the, uh, my mind is flooded with ideas and thoughts, and because I'm creative by nature, I don't censor them. Uh, unfortunately. Uh, in social occasions, we are all provided with a great deal of stimulating ideas and information. Unfortunately, I have no filtering mechanism, and therefore my wife always explains, it's okay, he's creative. Um, I, I tend to feel that I'm invisible in social occasions. This is really true. Uh, creative people are observers. We tend to be disengaged and passionate observers. To others, we, seem, we may seem aloof detached or even cold-hearted at times. To me, it, it, it feels like I'm watching the world while no one else knows about it. Of course, I'm only gathering fodder from you for my next novel or short story. So I'm creative and socially enough, but how did I get this way? Uh, well, let's uh, just by, oops, wait a minute. Uh, like so many other creative people I've spoken to, I was, I was bright, but not really an outstanding student. I did not accept the, the, the educational dogma that taught us there was only one right answer to every problem. I did not blindly accept my first idea as always my best idea. Oftentimes, it's your 100th idea is your best idea. I did not accept the adult world as being infallible. Adults were just merely children in grown-up clothing. Um, I did not accept the writings, teaching, and learning writings of my religion. I hungered for truth, real answers, not fables. I did not understand many of the rules and laws that uh, others created for me. I was not rebellious, not at all. I was just curious. I was full of questions that no parent, educator, religious person, or even books could explain. Okay, some of you might be smarting at the notion that creative people cannot be religious. It's not true. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. We may or may not accept religious doctrine as faith. What I'm saying is that creative people challenge everything. Life, loves, faith, educators, adults, clergy, playmates, politicians, oh yeah, uh, science, and historians. 
I never accepted the rules and their ways of thinking as the laws uh, or their religious laws. And therefore, I never lost my sense of escape, imagination, curiosity, sense of freedom and individuality. In my humble opinion, it takes a creative nature to forego the security and acceptance of the old world and venture out into the new and un unknown waters, especially later in our lives. Just for the mere fact that you were here in Mexico and, and many of you permanently for the rest of your lives is a wonderful indication of your creative selves. <clears throat> Perhaps this is why there are more artists, sculptors, poets, photographers, musicians, and writers on this lake than in just about any enclave I know of. So, what about you? Uh, you may have been brought up to fit in, to conform, not to question your parents, educators, religious leaders, and politicians. And my guess is that some of you were raised close to that course of acceptance. And my guess is that those of you who feel that one, you're either not very creative, or two, it's too late in life. So let's just find out who you are. Those of you who are, can I see the hands of those of you who are wildly creative in here? Wildly creative, okay. <laughs> very good. How about moderately creative? Moderately creative? <laughs> How about those of you who are not creative at all? <laughs> a little. A little creative. <laughs> okay. Uh, Patsy, you can't raise your hand for all three. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> That's very <where he> creative. <laughs> okay, so there is good news here. Unless your brains have been irreparably damaged through drugs or stroke or, <laughs> or head-on collisions or reality TV, then we all actually have the neural basis for creativity. And there's even better news. The brain is a marvelously responsive, adaptable, and it is eternally changing. We are literally remaking our brains. We are who we are, how we think, with all of our actions, reactions, postures, and positions, every minute of every day of the week for our entire lives. Hopefully your brain is changing just by attending today's open circle. Okay, that's a stretch. But, but, so, here's the good news for those of us who have entered our senior years. The brain is remarkably responsive, adaptable, and as I mentioned, internally changing organ. Its adaptations and changes occur in response to the demands and pressures of the environment it encounters. Okay, I want to repeat that. So listen carefully, because this is probably the most salient information I can, a tidbit I can, a knowledge I can share with you today. The brain adapts and changes in response to demands and pressures of the environment in, co in concert. It, it, it encounters. That's brilliant stuff, okay? Fill that environment with a steady stream of television reality shows and dumbed down sitcoms and the brain will slowly decay. Fill your environment with creatively challenging, mind stimulating books, music, art, language, travel, conversations, and the brain will flourish and grow. And as I addressed in my last open circle presentation, even video games are an excellent way to stimulate your, your mind and build the brain's neurons and synapses. Because that's actually what we're, we're doing all the time. We're building new, new neurons and new, new synapses in our brains. We've got billions of those, just how we use them. In a way, those of us who grew up during the radio days actually have a creative environment uh, over the TV generation. Plus, as seniors, we have a treasure trove of experience and memories that, might, that have mightily shaped our minds and brains. We have literally become what we have touched, smelled, seen, heard, read, done, and remembered over these years. We just need to find new ways to unlock the memories and unleash the creative magic. To that end, there are 10 steps that you can practice to harness your creative force. I have some visual aids. I actually caught visual aids once, but I'm okay now. <laughs> uh, these are the ten points that I think is that if we try to practice these, we will be so far ahead 
So first, what, number one is to learn to visualize more. As I mentioned before, television and movies, and, and, and actually much of the internet are material that is totally passive in content. Reading a book about unique and iconic characters or faraway places, lost societies, and well-written nonfiction will force you to visualize and imagine the characters and the places for yourself. Kind of what we did in the, in the radio days before television. Ask questions, especially from people who are trying to sell you something. This includes politicians, educators, and clergy too. Never take someone's declarations for the ultimate truth. Ask questions, seek validation, and make up your own mind. Ask questions. Record ideas. Okay. This is this is my. I used to record my ideas with pencil and paper and stick them in a folder or a box. I, this is my new one. A smartphone for really dumb people. This every smartphone comes with a built-in. Um, speech recognition uh, software. I've said, essentially now what I do is I just, I have an idea, I'm driving, or middle of the night, or whatever, my phone is close by, I pick it up, and I press the mic, the, the mic to talk into it, and I essentially just dictate my idea. My idea that has been dictated is then sent to me, but via email and a text file to my other computer. I now, I now store all of my all of my my ideas, my quotes, whatever they are, a fiction story, whatever it is, new invention from the product, whatever it is, I now store it in a text file in my main computer, and I put it wherever it needs to go. Very very elaborate uh, filing system for my ideas. The other thing is that when I was writing, I can only write. The best of us can only write 25 words a minute. I can dictate it 200 to 250 words a minute. Um, Henry James uh, wrote Turn of the Screw. Uh, and, uh, he, he dictated all of his novels. You know. many, uh, sometimes people have a better flow of uh, understanding for what they, they say. I, actually, I forget who it was that said uh, my uh, uh, my words, my, uh, my, my words are much better than what I write, something like that. Another writer who wrote, uh, uh, who dictated his words. So that's recording ideas. It's really important to record your ideas. Any, no matter how you do it, regardless of whether you do it in a, in a box with uh, scraps of paper and, and, uh, and napkins and whatnot, just record your ideas. That's really, really important. But then it's also really important to revisit those ideas. So I send myself emails and I store my ideas in carefully managed computer files while others scribble on, on scraps of paper and toss them in the box. The method isn't important. What is important is revisiting them regularly. Many of these ideas are random and have no value at the time they come to me. Over time, they become nuggets in my treasure hunt can be mine for new ideas, paintings, stories, recipes, I mean, on and on. Number five is to express ideas. Expressing can be drawing, shaping, scribbling, dancing, humming, dictating, and simply time set aside for daydreaming. Set aside time for daydreaming. Express those ideas to yourself. Express your ideas to your, your loved one or your wife. Uh, <laughs> or your husband. <laughs> the practice and habit of expressing, expressing your ideas don't have to be planned in a staged manner or staged way. Um, one of the beauties of writing for me is I can take my time sorting and shaping and expressing my thoughts before they're ready for presentation, before any of you would ever read them or see them. Writing gives me the freedom in the, in the time dimension and includes incubation. It's the same way with paintings, too. You're not going to see the painting until I'm happy with it, right? So I'm expressing ideas while I'm doing this. The negative aspects, aspect of, of writing or painting, looking out the window uh, part of the, of the creative process, I call it. It sounds, it sounds a little unremarkable, but if you practice expressing, the expression channel stays, stays open much better and much longer. Um, then number six is to think in new ways. When I, 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 one of my first creative jobs was I worked as a copywriter for a, a very large advertising agency in Los Angeles. I, 
I never actually began a writing assignment in the standard problem that meant solution. Typically, a, a, an account executive would come in and he'd say, we have this, this new soap and it cleans better and does all this, and can you write a 60 second radio commercial for it? And I'd say, oh, I don't want to do that, that's boring. I, you know, I want to do something a little bit different. I want to be a little more creative about it. So, so instead, I would, I would go on a field trip for an idea treasure hunt. I would do this all the time. Now this, uh, this entailed trips to used bookstores, toy stores, used clothing stores, uh, contemporary modern museums, carnivals, even junkyards from time to time. Now you know where I get all my clothes. Um, but so do things that you're not, not, not good at is also another way to stretch your thinking. Learn a few sentences in Russian or Japanese, you know. Participate in a fashion show if you're a guy. You know? Uh, use your non-dominant hand. I'm left-handed, but if I use my right hand, I'm, I'm stretching myself. Uh, drive a different route than you normally would drive to, you know, to a friend's house or to, to go out or wherever you're going. Hang out with kids without telling them what to do. <laughs> Thinking in new, new ways stretches and flexes our creative, creative muscles. There are a number of examples of consumer products and inventions which are creatively misdirected. For example, a Swiss engineer invented Velcro after examining mountain birds he removed from his dog's fur. That's where Velcro came from. Kleenex was invented as a makeup uh, remover before it became a more popular portable handkerchief. That's Kimber Clark's PR story. The truth is, is that they were actually, these tissues were used as gas mask filters in World War I, but Kimberly Clark doesn't want you to know that. that. Um, the yo-yo was originally a 16th century Filipino weapon before it was popularized as a toy. The first product Sony came out with was a rice cooker, and Nintendo's first product were playing cards. Now, the good news here is that there was some, someone in all of these companies that decided to think in new ways. Seven, wish for more. Wishing for more fits in with number one, which is questions, you know, which a, with asking questions requires imagining more. Imagine other colors, other characters, other realities. Imagine the final product. Imagine you're writing success. It's okay, uh, be okay with frustration along the way too, because it fuels invention through wishing for more. Number eight, try being creative. A lot of us admire creative acts and creative people but don't think of ourselves as creative. Well, before I became a writer, writer I had imagined myself writing, and I had imagined myself being a writer. And it worked. You imagine yourself into and created uh, you know, this new future. Sure, not all writing is creative, but all writing is creative. You know, requiring the creation of something that did not previously exist. There was nothing on that paper, regardless of what it is you wrote. We're being creative every minute of our life. We just don't give ourselves credit for it. So, you have been creative, therefore you can do creative, creative things. And you can do it again and again. Number nine, keep trying. Somewhere in our culture is this grand myth that if you've done something once and failed, it can't happen. My neighbor said, well, no, actually I had a neighbor, this is a great, I, how am I doing on time? Because I don't want to go over here too far, but. Have a question in 10 minutes. Okay, so I have 10 minutes? Okay. Yeah. I, have a, I had a neighbor when I was growing up, and a, a few of you have heard this story, but, so I apologize, but uh, he was an uh, amazing man. He was a electrical engineer who hated his job, could not stand what he did. He wanted out, he wanted something else. His wife said, what do you want to do? He says, I want to, be in, I want to do something creative. I want something to do something in music. And he said, uh, and she, she says, well, I didn't know you liked music. What can you do? I, uh, can you play? No. Can you sing? No. Can you write? No. Uh, so he wanted, he, he quit his job, a very, very good job. She went back to work while he went to Juilliard in Los Angeles. He studied. Within two weeks, he found out he was tone deaf. Didn't stop him. He kept on going. He wound up uh, became he became a very very famous uh, musical arranger 
arranged all the music for uh, Nelson Riddle and Frank Duvall and all the Frank Sinatra stuff uh, music for years. It, then he got his break as doing the arranging the music for all Disney's feature length uh, movies and cartoons, Fantasia, Snow White, and so forth. His name, his name was Carl Brand. He's no longer with us, but Carl wasn't done yet. He wanted to be more creative. He started to, uh, he, he, he got the NBC um, Symphony uh, Orchestra, or the M NBC Orchestra, who uh, was doing the Tonight Show. And they taped the Tonight Show was over at 6 o'clock, and they taped it. You know, we would see it late at night, but they taped it early in the afternoon. And so all these great musicians had nothing to do after 6 o'clock. He put them all together, and they started doing elevator music. And his elevator music became Montalbani. That's actually how Montalbani started. So these were, these are people who actually kept trying, no matter how bad it was, no matter you know what obstacles were in his face. Carl Brandt wanted to do music and he wanted to create create music and he did so. So um, So you just have to get past that inner critic. Okay, number 10 is to tolerate creative behavior. One of the things I had to do to prepare for this speech was to ignore the sound of your criticisms in my head. Mm -hmm. uh, the criticism will say, well, that's a nice piece of fluff, or uh, how, how can we get anything out of this 45 minutes and, and standing here in the rain? Uh, but I'm pretending that I, didn't, I don't hear a thing. And for now, I am simply tolerating my own creative behavior. Part of the creative process is releasing your fears, the fear of, no, of looking stupid, the fear of failure, the fear of standing out too much, the fear of success. Nothing can, uh, can help us feel more tolerant of creativity in others and supportive of it in ourselves. We are all afraid, and yet we get a lot of creative work done anyway. Maybe the act of creating makes us feel so responsive and playful uh, and align that it's really worth it. So, creativity rises from the brain. Its essence is the ability to perceive and think in original and novel ways. Remember to plant the seeds of creativity in your daily, daily life. And again, just to recap, learn to visualize more, ask questions, record your ideas and revisit them. Express those ideas, even if it's just to yourself. Express your ideas. Think in new ways wish for more, try being more creative, keep trying no matter what, even though K should have been capitalized. <laughs> and, tolerate great, and tolerate the creativity behavior. So, uh, questions? Comments? Yes, sir. <laughs> I love your red shoes. <laughs> you want to tell us where you got your red shoes and what that process was? Uh, they were a limited edition. They're called the, uh, the, the, red, uh, the Golden Dragon shoes. They were a limited edition. I saw them and I said, gee, that, that's, that, that's a way to express myself, mm -hmm. my individuality. I am not uh, apologizing or I'm not sure that's not quite the right word. But I would like to speak for women. Uh, I noticed that again, your examples were all males, especially the man who went, he did, went and did what he wanted and his wife supported him. I think we have an extra curl that we must run over, and that is that we were programmed to assist, to give help to husbands, to children, and so forth. And for many women, to be self-centered, which is really what highly creative people need to be, and I would agree with you 100%, we need to really, really get rid of a lot of stuff. 
there a question in there? But I didn't... <laughs> yeah, how come you didn't do lady exam? I didn't select these by gender. Um, trust me, there's no, there's no gender bias. Most of my experience um, has have been with um, working with men. Um, and when I worked in the so-called creative department at McCann Erickson, the advertising agency in Los Angeles, it was all men. The artists, the writers were all men. Um, the um, most of my contemporaries have been men in this world. Um, but that I don't. I really didn't intentionally select men over women. I selected creative people, and creative people. And I don't think there is a, a sexual, you know, pro proclivity or bias, and when it comes to creativity uh, and the creative mind, because the minds are minds all the same. Now I think that you make a good point about women having been somewhat programmed, and maybe they haven't, you know ventured out as far as men have in the, in the creative process and have been recognized as such. However, I, my speech today is really aimed at people who are seniors, who maybe feel like they have lost their edge, maybe felt like they were re restrained, and it wasn't really meant to be, um, you know, sexually driven, and it was, yeah, but, but it, uh, and so I think that Sometimes seniors say, well, I'm too old for this, or I'm too, I've been around too long, or I can't do it because of my age. And I, that's, the, that's the one thing that kind of um, fractures me, because uh, this, 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 this thing that we've got going on in here is really an amazing organ. And it doesn't, it doesn't really um, stop uh, its, you know, its growth and its uh, ability to, to uh, to think as long, as long as we decide that we can do some of these things ourselves and as long as we continue to exercise our brains and exercise our bodies, uh, you know, what's good for the heart is also good for the, uh, for the brain. So anything that we can do, and my wife has actually spoken several times about how to, how to build a better brain here at, uh, at Open Circle, and I've, uh, and so, those are, that, that's a kind of a message. Maybe I didn't make it quite as clear as I as I wanted to initially, but those that is the that was my objective here was to really talk about. And I think also I I, also, I started off by saying that I think I'm, I'm I'm preaching a little bit to the choir here because I think just the mere fact that those of you who have wandered into this wonderful life on this lake have uh, have a, a very very open attitude towards creativity and towards learning and towards growth and that many of you, most of you, are probably very, very creative already and, and you may be practicing a lot of these 10 points without even knowing it and just by bringing out the 10 points, I think that might help. Are there other questions? Oh, uh, all right, I'll repeat it. Uh, just 
going along uh, with the last two speakers, uh, there's apparently scientific evidence that the brains of women and men function slightly differently. And do we have any comments on that in terms of creativity? I'm going to let my wife answer that. <laughs> she's, a, she's really the expert on the brain. Can you hear me? Well, um, I think the more important issue is at what time of the day do you feel most creative? Each person is creative in their own way. It doesn't matter your sex. However, most of us don't recognize that creative spark. For example, when I get up in the morning, my brain doesn't tell me I must do this and I must do that. It's totally creative and free-spirited. So that's when I do my creative work. Other people can't function in the morning at all. So, but I think that the important thing is, when are you most creative? When are you able to shut off that brain that tells you you got to do this, you got to do that? And um, you can just be free to create whatever you create. Male, female, neutral, kitty cat, whatever you are. <laughs> You know, it's up to you to overcome the obstacles that get in your way of being creative. Uh, I don't think you really answered the question, but I would answer the question is that there are there are differences in the brain, but not when it comes to creativity. That's pretty much the uh, the, the creative brain is pretty much the same in men and women. Uh, it, it what what seems to you know uh, stall creativity is some of, some of our upbringing, some of our our habits as children, some of our our, uh, our inability to to be unique and stand out, and not and our fears or our desires to fit in, sometimes they will stall creativity. But that's not a function of sexual uh, or, 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 or the way we are differently brought up to in the brain. But, I think the issue was the fact that you say we are all seniors if you are 36 years of age. Uh, I, I wonder if the four bit books that you have written have been published. Yes, um, they're on uh, Amazon, um, and they've been published under under my name R. M. Krakow, and uh, they. Uh, and who are you alluding to if it's 36 here? When you, when you started the talk, you said at 36. I'm oh, 36. okay. That was when I moved to Topeka, Kansas. I was 37. I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a little over, I'm in my 70s now, so I won't, I won't think. So I, I think I'm cool. I'm actually getting the discount, so I'm pretty sure I'm saying <laughs> I just wanted to thank you for coming and speaking about creativity today. It's a topic that I have been interested in and have re done some reading on it uh, for quite a few years now. Um, and I particularly commend you for uh, sharing so much uh, of your inner self with us. That took some courage. Um, and it was very interesting, and um, I, I want to commend the lady in the red hat for her comments also. She usually comments every Sunday that I've been here. She, she's the first one that has a question or a comment, and, um, and she makes courageous comments. Yeah, I, um, I, I agree. I think that I, I do commend that anybody who makes courageous comments. Yes. I think that's the first step in just not, you know, I mean, I, would, I wouldn't I would even believe what I think, you know. I mean, you've got to ask your own questions. You have to make your own decisions. You have to be your own man or woman. You have to decide that you're, you're going to express yourself. And, and don't listen to what other people are always saying. It's, it's, you know, that's probably the best, the best piece of advice I can give to you is just keep asking questions. Keep, keep uh, pressuring people for answers. Don't accept that there's only one right or one or wrong answer. The world is full of shades of gray and uh, ambiguity. 
And that's what the real world is. That's actually why I taught that class. That class was supposed to help people deal with uh, graduate students with the ability to go to the outside world and fit in to become better, uh, to, to understand the corporate world or the business world uh, and what it's really like. Because school doesn't necessarily prepare you very well for that. It prepares you for a lot of other things, I mean, advanced education, graduate degrees, PhDs. They prepare you for a lot of a lot of really good good thinking, but it doesn't necessarily pre prepare you for the real world. So that's actually why, when I sat down with the dean, we discussed what my what I would be talking about uh, and what my curriculum was going to be. Uh, that's how we, that's how we wound up with uh, creativity in the brain. So that was, uh, and I, as I said, I did that for four years, and I really enjoyed it. I really did, and I loved having. You know, dealing with his young minds are great minds. And I, I shouldn't sound like I was putting them down, because there was a lot there, there was a lot of good exchange going on back and forth between people. But um, but I thank you for your comment. I guess. I take much courage. <laughs> All you have to do is do it once, and twice, and thirty times, and you'll get something. I guess we'll have one more question. If we run out. Period. How? I'd like to hang around with you. Sit down. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 It's, I mean, that's what's, I mean, that, again, that's what's so wonderful about being here. You can decide, you can be, you, you can decide whether you want to, you know, be a hermit or you decide you want to fit in or you want to be part of, part of the group, but uh, this is such a creative environment. There's so many creative people on the lake and there's so many talented, really, really talented people here that it's wonderful and it gives you an opportunity to stimulate. Uh, and I mentioned before, some of this, um, you know, business about, um, <clears throat> thinking in new ways and, and trying to be more creative is how, how you're really, you know, as an osmosis, you're really judged by the, uh, a lot of times you, you're, you're judged by the people you keep your company with, too. And um, so I think that's extremely important. Thanks so much. Yeah. Now we all see those shoes. <laughs> you get found in the Red Shoe Society. Well, Next Sunday, Hans Proklus will speak on energy resources in Mexico. Now, please pick up your coffee cups and stack the chairs by color and style. Thank you for coming, and we hope to see you next Sunday.